we're looking at Hebrews 2, 5 through. I'm going to look through 9. I got 8 on your paper. Um, and actually, if you have a study Bible, if you look in there, they're going to show you 5 through not, uh, 5 through 8. That's the reason I originally did that, because most study most of your study Bibles, that's we call that context. And um, but I'm going to include on your papers through eight, but I'm going to read through nine uh, on it. Here's what it says: For he did not subject. For he did not subject to angels the world to come. Concerning which we are speaking. Now he's going to quote. He's going to quote, quote Psalms 8. Okay, in your, in your study Bible, he's going to quote Psalms 8, 4 through 6. That, that's David. Now, here's what's important because of what the proof text he's going to give. Look at, look at his opening statement, 5. He did not subject, because that's been his subject in chapter 1 and 2, is the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant, and he's dealing with angels. He did not subject to angels the world to come. What do you think that is? Do what? Uh huh. Huh? Anybody else? Millennium. And the key for that understanding is that this is an Old Testament messianic passage. See, Psalms eight is a uh, is an Old Testament messianic passage, and uh, that's the reference point. And. And Rick, I think Rick, you hand you mentioned that last night about the second coming of Christ, who would be involved in that war and who would occupy the millennium. It'll be essence, right? The Old Testament, New Testament, right? Uh, that's a pretty powerful idea. It won't be angels, but but wait a minute. The world that is here. Is subject to whom? Well, not, not, what the passage say? Watch now. For he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. So they are. They're, they're a major part of the function of the world as we know it. The, and what we would call this world, in a biblical standpoint, is the post-Diluvian world. Agreed? And, it, and that makes the millennial pretty pretty important place. Then verse 6, but he has testified somewhere, and we know what it, where that where is. What is man that thou rememberest him? Question. Or the son of man that thou dost concern about him? Question. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Do you know that's not what the Hebrew Bible says? There's a definite word for angels. This is not it. This is the word Elohim. See the word angels in verse 7? Made them a little lower than the angels. This is the word Elohim. It has the, it has the, it has the, uh, it has a preposition, a Hebrew preposition on the front of it, uh, which is a, uh, this comes from the Septuagint. This comes from the Septuagint. And it comes exactly from the Septuagint. You know, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, agreed. And that's how they translated this. Now, what does Elohim mean? But it's plural, isn't it? So it can be either God's little g, or it can be big God calling Trinity or Godhead. Now, <clears throat> so as a Bible student, you know, I'm under, I, I believe that I am commanded as a teacher to look at things ice. 
That's my method of teaching. But picked that up from the colonel. I think it was a very excellent idea of hermeneutics. Her hermeneutics is a very big deal in the way you translate uh, for, for knowledge. And ice is the key. That isagogus means historical. Be very familiar with the historical background. Check it out exegeting. And then um, categorize it. <laughs> Thank you. Then categorize it. Well, when you come to a passage like this, I'm required to look at it in the Greek because it's, it's a Greek text. Uh, the English grabbed it from the Greek. And then I have to go look at it Hebrew because it's, it's a translation of the Hebrew, right? So then I have to go translate the Hebrew. Then when you do, you go like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> I got a problem right off the bat. When I have a problem from the Hebrew text to the English text, then I go to the Septuagint because that's where the New Testament you know, that was Jesus' Bible, so to speak. And so you, 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 pay, you, then you go back. And when you go back, you go like, whoa, they translated that exactly. Um, they translate it with the, with the uh, preposition para plus uh, the Greek word for angels. So then you, you go like, well, I wonder what this really means. So now you have to go and you have to do <laughs> an exhaustive word study on Elohim and almost all Hebrew scholars and that's who you now begin to, to depend on because it's pretty hard to run word studies out of Hebrew there's not a lot of information on it so you have to now you have to go to really good solid conservative theologians of Hebrew and almost all of them translated this as a reference to angels. So we're pretty safe with this, I think. But I think there's a greater meaning in it because God knows how to translate something. He knows the, the Hebrew word between angel and God. But Job is probably the greatest book of understanding this. It's one of the reasons I studied it. Um, We'll talk a little more about it, but I'm just saying sometimes it looks pretty simple to you in the paper. Then it, all of a sudden you exegete, it becomes a little complicated. Then when you sort it all out, you come back and say, well, I think they're probably right. <laughs> English translation is pretty good. King James, New American Standard, they're pretty good. They are pretty good. But anyhow, there, there's one of them. Thou hast crowned him. Thou hast made him. Now we're this, the man. See, everything, look at verse 6. The man mentioned twice. Now we have that man mentioned him again by him. Thou hast crowned him. Thou hast appointed him. You've put everything under his feet. Right? Now we, now we know who that man is, don't we? And so he says, thou hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast appointed him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we do see him. That's why I included verse 9. But we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. But you say, now, wait, now Elohim comes back in the picture. Because he was equal with God in the past, is equal with God now, right? But when he took on humanity in incarnation, he was lower than God. And so I see... Elohim has a role in this and why God didn't say angels said Elohim even while it does refer to angels in the greater picture because we live in the world where they're still ministering. Does that make sense? And I do think that's what the writer of Hebrews grasped. But what I'm just telling you what I think, uh, you know. But we do not see him who has been made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus. See, that's his human. See, that's the name for his humanity. That's incarnation, isn't it? 
uh, suffering of death crowned with glory and honor. Now we know the, uh, what, what, what brought him crowned with glory and honor was his death on the cross. That by, that by grace, he might taste death for every one of us. The man, that's hypostatic. The man tasted death for each of us. What a wonderful thing. So, you know, my job is to tell you as much as I know about the translating everything, and in the end, to try to encourage you, it all comes out pretty good. <laughs> but I do think we know why he used Elohim here, because he's talking about the incarnation of Jesus Christ, which hadn't been totally revealed unless you put a whole lot of stuff together, right? You'd have to put virgin birth and all this kind of stuff together and come up with something. Um, he did it kind of the most unique way. And the writer of Hebrew got it, in my opinion. Uh, well, you know, we believe he was inspired of God to teach us. Uh, I'm just excited that I understand it. So. Uh huh. Right. Well, what he says, uh, let's see, five. Let's see, I lost my place. I was chapter 3. <clears throat> he did not subject uh, angel cover, but has testified somewhere saying, what is man? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, man, man in general. Mm -hmm. it, it, but, but listen, we know what he means by man in general because Jesus, man in general, in, in this prophetic word, is the man that came in human form that was hypostatic. Well, because that's the identify now the, the fact that Messiah, we are all, all of us, what is man that thou are mindful of him is true of all of us, right? But, the re, but with the son of man, what makes him unique is that he's going to be born to be able to bear the sins of the world on a cross. That's verse nine, see? Yeah, that's good, Patty. That's very good. Yeah, because we all believe we're included in it. Why does God remember us? I mean, the, the greatest thing for us is they sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Um, but back then, they didn't have all that picture together unless somebody put it for them, did he? Today, that's, kind of, that's where we've got to start with the picture <laughs> and work our way around. It's just interesting. It's just kind of, this is a landmark passage, isn't it, Horton? I mean, this Psalms 8, 5 through 8, is dynamite. And, and you guys are right on the money with it. You'll recall that last week we studied God's judgment upon the archangel Lucifer. That's Latin for devil uh, for morning, the morning star. Lucifer and the fallen angel were sent into the lake of fire. We talked about that last night. And listen, it's always described this way. The lake of fire that occurs at the end of human history. I can't tell you how important that is. Now, we all believe that, right? I mean. That tells you why human history came into existence, doesn't it? People go like, well, I don't care where you get that. I mean, I don't know a theologian in the world where they believe it or don't believe it. Don't add that. This lake of fire, when does it occur after the great, you know, it's at the end of human history. I mean, it's the end of the Bible if, if you stay with the Bible. I just find that interesting. And, 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 it, 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 and it's attached to what we studied last night. That's been important. Uh, so let me talk about five things. And here's the important human history. The key. Oh, yeah, I got to have a word of prayer. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, my, my engine got revved up pretty quick here. All right, let's do this. I give you, you know, I say it all the time, but the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it, nor can you apply it in carnality, evidence of carnality. Would be personal sin, it could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue and avert sins. At least that's a place to start. Uh, how do I get out of carnality into spirituality? Where the dynamics that where the dynamics of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and everything works according to the plan of God in your life. Confession of sin. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. I mean, how good is that? So I give you a moment through your priesthood to make confession if necessary. Offer a prayer that God would teach you some unique things about the world in which we live. 
Not the world to come and not the world is past. The world is here now. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come out to study in a collective setting, rather than set at home and be in the comfort zone and listen to three or four people talk on the television and telephone calls and think they've concentrated and been to Bible study. No way you can hear the still small voice of God when there are so many other voices distracting. So I'm thankful for these that have come our way, and I'm, I'm thankful for those who now have turned off the, any kind of distraction in their life for the next hour and will study with us where the Holy Spirit can minister to their spirit the truth and not have other voices minister their spirit away from it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here's point number one. One reason for the creation of the human race was to resolve Lucifer's appeal of God's sentence to the lake of fire at the end of human history. I mean, we definitely saw this uh, in Matthew 25, 41. We dealt with that as well as Revelation 20, 10. And that's a, that's a big deal. You can understand the principle of human volition in the angelic conflict behind the devil's appeal in the life of Job. It, it, it would serve you well because you're very knowledgeable now of, of the two tests in the, uh, as the book of Job opens over Job's life. And it would serve you well to go back because this, this is the world in which you and I live. This is the way this thing works in our life. Uh, Job is not the only guy. He's the first guy mentioned that God represented but in Job's first personal test, you, you should read carefully Job 1, 6 through 22, and, and watch how this thing plays out in the angelic conflict because this is, this is the world in which you and I live. And then the second test comes in the second chapter, verses 1 through 10. And here's what's important. Here's one of the things. That, there's a lot of important things in this, but here's one important thing. Even in the Old Testament, much more so in the New Testament, the devil has to have permission over any believer. Now, not over an unbeliever, but he has to have permission to mess with any believer. So when undeserved suffering comes to your life, just understand who's wrote o who is written off on it. Agreed? You know, we talk about three categories of suffering. We talk about self-induced misery, undeserved suffering, and divine discipline. Right? Yeah, the thorn's a good example of it, isn't it? Yeah, you're right. Well, one of the great things is, is for us to understand and listen. Uh, when God talks to him, he said, uh, well, Listen, even, it's important. I don't have time tonight, but it's even important to pay attention who shows up. And, and where, do, where are they? When they show up at heaven, where did they, you know, like if you go to City Hall, you got to know where you're going or you got to find a register to tell you where you're going. I, I, well, I want a hunting license. I want a driver license. I want to change the deed. I want to do this, right? You ought to pay attention when they, when they show up, they show up in a court setting. You need to pay attention who shows up and how that thing operates. <clears throat> that would be encouraging, wouldn't it? And then think who is the who is the who is your representative there today in the church age? Right? Could he, this stuff is the now world. He could do this stuff. This is called the angelic conflict, man. He's gonna do this stuff. And when, 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 and listen, you have something that Job didn't have. You have a personal attorney, attorney that represents every aspect of you, right? That's the advantage of living in church age. Uh, and when we have somebody ab absolutely. That's gone. That's been to the cross. Been nailed to the cross. Has been raised from the dead. I mean, and he tells him what he can do and what he can't do. I mean, who set? Who's seated at the right hand of God the Father today with all authority, all excusia, 
with all absolute authority, excusia, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he's the man, as they say here. He's the man. He's the man. And so, uh, it, 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 and then you see the testing that goes on and what's up for grabs and what God is interested. You know, you, let, let's see, this won't be a gate question, but what is a key word that God was looking for out of, the, out of Job in the book of Job? There's one word that God wants to see out of his life, out of this testing. There's one word that, that God just chunks into the book of Job. Do I? Hmm? Maybe it'd be a gate question. Integrity. Oh, yeah, now, yeah. Integrity. Right? Integrity. Once this, once this test starts, that's what it's about. <laughs> Well, I don't know, but I know he had some. And sometimes it got really thin too, didn't it? I mean, sometimes that's all he hung on to was that thread of doctrine of loyalty to God called integrity. When all else fails in your life, integrity keep your nose clean. You understand what I'm telling you? Integrity, nothing but pure integrity for God. Well, yeah. Integrity is a bigger word. It's a bigger word. It ought to be a key word in your vocabulary. It's a bigger word. And listen, when we see it in people, whether it's on the battlefield or in the church or wherever we see it, we're impressed, are we not? Integrity is a wonderful thing. And I'll tell you, when people manifest it, you never forget them. Jane's dad was a man of integrity. My grandfather, Holman, was a man of integrity. I talk about him all the time. I think about them every week. I think about these men. They influenced my life. They were men of integrity. When that old man was laying on the dying bed, he called me in. And he said, you're my man. I want you to be a man of integrity for me. I have tried to be a man of integrity to my family, and I want you to be a man of integrity I said, sir, I'm not quite sure I can grasp that. He said, well, let me spell it out to you, son. Take care of my girls. You take care of my girls. I have spoiled them. And you're going to have your hands full. But you're a man of integrity. I've never forgot those words. I've tried to be that man to these, to these three women. And uh, plus... Seemed like God, as soon as I got that down, he gave me all women. I don't know what happened. But a man of integrity. See, he didn't have to tell me. I knew he was. I saw that. You see integrity. You feel it. You touch it. It, it, it stays with you. If you've had people of integrity in your life, you know that. They, they put a mark on you that's in a, in a very wonderful way. Men of integrity. Women of integrity, it doesn't have to be men, it, people of integrity. And who better than believers? Now, that's not my subject, even though I'm rambling on here. Uh, but it's a key word in undeserved suffering. When you're under, when you're under, in the angelic conflict, when you, when you wake up and go like, holy catfish, I'm in a mess here. <laughs> uh, like Paul did, like Horton said in 2 Corinthians 12, Integrity is going to be the name of the game. I mean, you hold on to that no matter what no matter what he puts your life through. You hold on to God's integrity. This is a mutual, that's a two-way street. And God is a man of integrity. The Lord Jesus Christ, a man of integrity. Be one. Well, you can understand the principle here from the life of Job, in my opinion, about the importance of human volition. See, this whole, this whole thing with Job was about volition. He gave it to him. He said, give, give it to me. I'll take every, I'll strip him of every possession he has in life. Job says, naked I came in and naked I go out. God gave it to me to start with. You want it? You got it. I could care less. I don't have a possession in my life. He took his kids. 
They said, God gave them to me. They were gifts from God. So he took his cattle. They were gifts from God. He took his house. They were gifts from God. Everything he had. Naked I came in. Naked I came out. He said, okay, I'll take the naked. So that was the second test. And he, listen, he peeled, he peeled, he peeled his skin off of him alive right down to the bone. Think about that. He peeled his skin off from him right down to the bone. Now, he stuck so bad, he, he, his flesh rotted so bad that nobody in a pretty good distance could get around him because he stunk so bad. And everybody advised him a, a thousand and one ways of how to get out of that. You can't get out of undeserved suffering. Either God puts you in it, God removes you from it. And he may never remove you from it. Now, Job has a wonderful ending to that story. That's a hallmark deal, in it? Gets a kiss at the end and rides off in the sunset. I mean, you can't beat that one. Listen, didn't, did, it didn't happen to Paul. So don't get crazy with this stuff. It, Paul died with his, and it got worse. <laughs> If we believe the account that he had his head chopped off, I mean, that's kind of bad. Huh? I used to do it with chickens, but I never did it with people. You can understand, you can understand the principle of human volition and why it's a key in the angelic conflict when you study demons and Jesus. Like in Matthew 5, when you study that little passage, and you have, I'm just going to remind you of it, with the demons, when they met Jesus and they approached him and it was eyeball to eyeball, so to speak, when it was person to person, they about fainted, right? They collapsed. They had a meltdown. You know what about? Thought, thought it was the second coming. <laughs> they thought it was the second coming. Whew. See, they didn't know the difference between the first and second coming like anybody else did. It's a mystery doctrine. And you can read about it. I put down Mark 5. That's a classic, the demoniac. I put that down. And I, I put down Luke 4. I love that one. And, and, and uh, who doesn't quote uh, James 2.19? Right? Anybody know James 2.19 off the bat? Just give it roughly. Demons what? Just rough. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. They believe and tremble. They believe in God. Even the demons believe in God and tremble. What's wrong with you people? You're right. That's what he's saying to them. Isn't he? How is it possible? I mean, even I mean, you believe in God and don't tremble uh, uh, about your life with him? Well, anyhow, it's just kind of interesting. Here's the second point. Adamic fallen humanity was created inferior to angels, but in the image according to the likeness of the Godhead. See, that, that Genesis 126, 27 is a big deal. And at, at our Sunday table, um, all the family gathered around it, us eating. Of course, we, we, we talk a little bit of sports and a little bit of politics and then a whole lot of Jesus. That's usually how our dinner goes. And school being opened up, uh, a lot of them are teaching, a lot are teaching, a lot of them are, are actively engaged with different school activities, helping schools and that. And so... They were talking about evolution and creation and how these teachers are, how they're teaching it in the public school system and how they're advising their friends how to teach it, like, like Terry, Rhonda. Now, Rhonda's doing a little bit better because she's in a Christian school, so there's a little more liberty than what Terry has. But, so I was really interested in how Terry was approaching this whole subject, and boy, I'm telling you, uh, I mean, she's... She's part of my family, but I mean, she's dynamite. She's dynamite. How she's able 
to take science and turn it into God. And nobody can refute it is amazing. I sat and I listened to her. Boy, I mean, you talk about taking notes. Everybody was taking notes. I mean, you know, you don't let anybody silence you until they take your head off. You know, there are a lot of ways to be sharp for Jesus and tell the story. And you can tell it in such a way to say, I wonder what the, if that's not that, what would that be, class? And every, all the Christian kids in the class say, that's creation. Oh, well, that's interesting. And on she goes. No, it's too good. It's too good. I love that. But anyhow, uh, Genesis 126, 27 is very important, the angelic conflict, because we're told that we're different. The rest of creation, the rest of creation is under men. You remember that? Men, uh, uh, after their species or kind. Ah, you're such a good class. And, um, and we're made in the image according to the likeness of God. Salim DeMuth, that kind of business. And, and that's kind of the interest that Hebrews, this passage in Hebrews 2 has in mind. Even the only begotten son of man was made a little lower than the angels or a little lower than the Godhead, right? I mean, the humanity of Christ. For God to take on humanity and dwell among men and be tempted by the devil. Do you understand how degrading that would be? Huh? The son of God being tempted by the devil? You'd want to reach up there and pull his teeth out. Can you imagine that? But he has to, and he has to maintain it, and he has to fight the same way you and I fight in our humanity, by the word of God. Or he don't make it. What a great lesson for us. Because not only does the Lord Jesus Christ fight our battles on one scale, but we have the indwelling Holy Spirit fight it on a second scale. I mean, we're all superheroes, aren't we? We're all super jocks because of the Holy Spirit in us. Left to our own, we're all different. We're all different categories. We're fair in this and fair at that and fair in this and fair in that. With the Holy Spirit, we're all super jocks. I'm, I'm talking in terms of football and baseball, <laughs> in case we don't know what I'm talking about. Volition makes the human race free agents in the angelic conflict. Free agents. That's the only thing that makes us free agent uh, as unbelievers. Every member of the human race can believe or reject God in his gospel of grace salvation. John 3.16, you know what the key word is? Believe. You know, uh, Romans 1.16, you know what the key word is? Believe. In John 5.24, you know what the key word is? Believe. You know what believe is? It's pastuo. It's the verbal form or the action form of pistos, which is the word faith. <laughs> now, you know who doesn't want you to believe any of this? And you know what I said? You know who doesn't want you to what? Believe any of this stuff? Huh? Cause you know why? what he is? He's a liar. He's the father of lies. I was teaching this to a little class. The other, the other ch little church I had when I was going through school, schooling, they, were, they, they requested that I go set in on different classes and meet the kids because the kids didn't know who the half pastor was. They most around here, they probably don't either, but I teach both sessions here. If I didn't, I'd probably do the same thing again because it was really enlightening to me. And I was talking about them, you know, I, when I kid grew up, it was a liar, liar, pants on fire type of thing. And so I would tell the little kids, this, they don't laugh. Oh, yeah, blah, blah. But apparently they, uh, not, I had to teach another generation, you know, <laughs> and then, and I would say, the f devil. Yeah, they go like the devil. I say he's the father of lies. <laughs> I mean, never had a class they didn't raise their hand and say a father of flies. <laughs> I never had a class that didn't say that a father of flies. I don't understand that, Pastor. I said, well, 
when you come out to the big church, we'll explain that. But in the little church, we just leave it go. And it says, all right with me. Three, the fall of Adam was a classic example of spiritual warfare attack upon human volition. The fall of Adam is the classic example. You say, well, but, you know, I just can't believe it. The people don't believe that man has free will. And I said, well, why do you have a watch? Why do you have a calendar? Why do you care what day it is? I mean, what's it matter? I, mean, I, I don't, I, I never have understood that. But the fall of Adam is very clear. He, he, he gives him two commands. And boy, this is well worth you studying when you go to Genesis 3. He gives him two commands. In verse 16, he says, eat of all the trees in the garden. They're all yours. Just eat, eat, eat. And in the middle of that garden was the tree of life, right? Eat of all the trees in the garden. Verse 17. But see that tree out there? That's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Take a good look at it, children. I want you to see that tree. Mm -hmm. Don't eat that tree. That's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat from that tree, die and you will die. Now, if they raised their hand and said, we don't understand death, that would have been a fair question, right? Because they, they hadn't seen anything, and how would he illustrate that? I don't know they ever raised their hand and asked that, but they certainly went through it, and they did it volitionally because that's a command, don't eat. Here's a command, eat of all. Here's a command, don't eat. Now, they didn't have a problem with the positive command. Eve didn't have a problem. She ate of all the trees. But the one in the middle where he said, don't eat, it's just like any kid when you tell them you can't do something, uh, they just worry to death to do it. Didn't have a sin nature, so can't blame that, right? You know what got her? Serpent. The talking serpent. Got her. It's well worth your read. The devil tries it with Jesus, like I said in Matthew 4. That's what the humanity meant to him. The devil had thought he, and he could. He could step right up into his presence and challenge him. Jesus had to beat him like you and I. He couldn't pull his credit card out and say, whose name is on this badge? Son of what? The, oh, I didn't hear you. The son of what? <laughs> say, say that just a tad bit louder. The son of God. <laughs> well, but he had to beat him. He had to beat him with the sword of the spirit. And, all right. So John 8, 44 through 45. I, I love the, the way Jesus, Jesus refers to him as the first murderer. He says there's no truth in him. And he's the father of flies. No, I mean lies. <laughs> and listen what he says. And, and, and I put there's a, there's a couple of scriptures in there well worth your reading. I wrote them down for you. He says, but because I speak the truth, now he's speaking to other people, but because I speak the truth, you won't believe in me. The devil speaks you lies. You go, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. I speak the truth. And you go, I don't believe it. We're back in the Garden of Eden, you, you guys. <laughs> We're back in the Garden. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3, and then 13 through 15, he's called the, 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 the master disguiser and deceiver. And he says his purpose is to lead astray the mind, the mind led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. That's the name. That's the end game, as they say. The end game. What's the end game? There it is. In Genesis 3, 1 through 13, the, and this is what, when you go back, look at this stuff the next time. The devil asks a question to Eve. Then he makes an exclamation. Oh, this is so good. I want you to do it on your own study. Then as soon as he gets her answers from this, he begins to teach her. He begins to teach her, and he, he, he has worked bait, 
and luring to hook her. You got that? Bait and switch type of stuff. Well, that's well worth your read because it's his strategy. Once he has permission, it's his strategy. Don't let him fool you. He's a master disguiser and deceiver. It is interesting that after the fall of Adam, Satan gained control or, or dominion over the world, but not over man's volition. Now, he didn't gain control over the, over the earth, but over the world. The world is the economy of, that, that occurs on the earth. You understand? Like John 3, 16, for God so loved the what? World. The, the living commodity business. So, and, and here's, here's how it's described by Jesus in, his, in the upper room discourse. In John 30 and 31, he says that he's the God of this world. He's the ruler of this world. And he's a little G. And he's an angel. Right? Lucifer is an angel. He's the God of this world. In John 14, he's the God of this world. In, in, in John 16, 11, he is. And I'll show you something interesting there. You remember, I think it was it was it last night that I I showed you a Matt, Matthew 25, 41 in the Greek with the perfect passive participle. All right. Here's another one. This this uh in in um Let's go to that for a moment with me. Let's go to John 16. I'll have to hunt it up, uh, but it will be the it'll be the one uh, has been judged. Um, let's so let's find that whatever that verse is. I, I'm not quite sure. I just put it. Listen, 11 through 16. If I were no eight. Wait, John 16 8 through 11 is one Greek sentence. That's important. All right, let me get to John 16. John. John 16, looking at verses 8 through 11, 8 through 11. Um, it, when he comes, he will convict the world, right? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. When, when the comforter, the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning judgment. Now he breaks them down. He says, uh, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me, 10, Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me. Verse 11, and concerning judgment. Now, here, here we have the judgment in verse 8 described. Now concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. See, has been judged? Now, that's key. Has been judged. Now, in the English, when you see has been judged, the odds are that's a perfect tense. And the odds are, the word been, is it, that it's a perfect passive. All right? Now, in this one, this is a perfect passive indicative of krino, K-R-I-N-O. And the perfect tense is important. What's perfect tense mean? Complete in the past, where the results, it means completed forever or until the word of God tells you otherwise. Now, you see, this takes us back to that same deal the, the, because the ruler concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world, now he's talked about him in 12 and 14 and 16, agreed? The ruler of this world has been judged in the perfect tense, and it goes back to the same place that Matthew 25, 41 does. And he's talking about the same thing as judgment. Are you with me? And listen, the key of that, once again, is that if you follow the devil in disobedience and reject the gospel of Christ, you're going to wind up the same place. You're going, to, you're going to wind up under the same judgment to the same place, like fire. That's kind of interesting. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, it talks about his strategy. It says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. That's the unbeliever. In whose case, the God of this world. You see, the question is, how did he become that? See, the one who go negative to God 
and the one who goes negative to the gospel of Christ, now I don't mean one time, I mean at some point, they're cooked. Uh, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving ones so that they might not see so that, this is the purpose, see, this is his strategy, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. John 14, 9. Listen, this is what the demons knew that people didn't. Listen, it says, in John 14, 9, it says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And he's talking about, he's talking about, he's talking about being able to see with the, with the mind, be able to perceive something. What makes me different or unique? What makes me the guy who's fulfilling messianic prophecy? See? I mean, who else is doing the stuff I'm doing? Listen, every miracle he did was according to schedule. I mean, prophetic schedule. He just go around, well, I, let's say, let's, let's have some sport today. Shall we kill a chicken or a goose? I mean, he didn't just go around and do sports. Well, let's do this one. Let's do that one. Listen, we haven't done, I haven't done any healing in a week. I better do a couple to keep my point average up. That's <clears throat> not why he did it. <clears throat> right? When you study Isaiah, you know that. <clears throat> now watch this. Listen, what, listen to Acts 26, 18 for just a moment. Let's talk about wh how we win people to Christ. You take the information and deliver it. You tell them the gospel correctly. You tell them what they have to do, right? You tell them what Christ did so what they can do so they can be saved by grace. Agreed? Who convicts them of sin, of righteousness, and judgment? The Holy Spirit. We got the easy part. Once we deliver the mail, once they hear it, now he's got them. Now, listen, I remember those days of my life. I remember when it was delivered to me, and I went, well, that's interesting. Boom. Then I, listen, and I mean, I was afraid to shut my eyes at night sometimes. I was afraid I was going to die and go to hell. Where'd that come from, Ron Adama? I have no idea, I would say, inner dialogue. I've never been afraid of anything. At least I've never been afraid of dying. Where'd this come from? I'll tell you where it came from. Because my mind always went back. I wonder if what they're telling me about the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. That my mind always went back there. It always went back to that seed that had been sown in my life about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It always went back there. And I finally went like, look, this is stupid. Just go ahead and believe it, you dummy. What you got to lose? Yeah. See, I didn't know it then, but Horton said everything, and you're absolutely right. <laughs> Good thing I didn't know that up front. Good thing I didn't know that. To, listen, to open their eyes, I want you to write this down. Over that, open your eyes. Write this down because it's going to be important to you. Write down Genesis 3, 5. And when you study that Genesis 3, 1 through 7 account, pay attention to devil, how the devil's strategy to hook her he baited her, he lured her, and he hooked her, right? Pay attention to that. <clears throat> and pay attention what she, what he promised her. The devil lied to her in such a way that when she actually ate of the tree, his prophecy would be fulfilled. And he thought he could hook her another day. He thought he had a hook in her, and he could just drag her to shore and drag her and show her off wherever he wanted to show her off. Right? That's what we do with trophies, right? We mount them and put them on our wall and after we've carried them around in our truck for a while. At least that's the way they used to do in the north. We... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. There's a whole other subject. But listen, pay attention to 3.5. The devil lied to her in hopes. You know what he told her? Uh, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. But I tell, where did I tell you to write that verse? Above, open your eyes. 
That's a key. To open their eyes. See, that's what the devil told her. Open your eyes. To open your eyes so that you may turn from darkness to light, from the domain, dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Hmm. Of course, one of my great passages that I love is Colossians 1, 13, 14. You're very familiar with it. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And you know what God has pounded in my heart for the last couple of years? And I say it all the time now. When you're forgiven, your sins are forgotten. And that's in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. Somewhere around verse 17. Here's five. Jesus Christ will come into the world two times to resolve the angelic conflict. The first time was to resolve the sin-death issue of Adam's sin. Romans 5, 12 through 21. 1 Timothy 1, 15. Romans 5, 8. And here's one I, I don't think I put on your paper that should be there. I missed it unless I wrote it later, was 1 John 3, 8. Did I put it on your paper? Oh, boy. Okay, it is now. And that's a key one because that's the one that says that he appeared, Jesus Christ came into the world. He appeared to destroy the works of the devil. You know why? Because, listen, Every person that believes the gospel of Jesus Christ is baptized by the Holy Spirit into union with Christ, and we're seated in a position above all. We're seated above in a position. Listen to me, of all authority, all exclusia. We're, we're seated in a position above all authority. You understand what I mean? In Christ, nobody's had that. Nobody's had that privilege, and we've got that. That's amazing to me. Thank you, Jesus, for letting me. Living the day I lived. Send me to the south so I could get saved. Thank you, Jesus. I thought I was coming down to get an education, and boy, howdy, did I ever. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. Now watch that. See the word hina? Hina is used with subjunctives for purpose. It could be purpose or it could be result. In this case, purpose. It, it, they're kind of a combination. It's kind of a combination of purpose with result. Now, I wrote down two subjectives, subjunctives. So pay attention because they set up two purposes, divine purposes. He, of him partaking, uh, we call it the incarnation, hum, humanity. That through death, he might render powerless. There should only be, actually, I put the compound word in there. There's never two A's like that. But that's a, that's a compound word. That first, that's kata, our gale, to render powerless. Him, through death, the Christ, Jesus Christ, might render him, the devil, powerless. Him who had the power of death. Now, he don't have the power of death over you. We know that from Ecclesiastes. What he has is he controls the dominion over which spiritual death lives. Do you understand that? He's the God of the what? Wait, come on now. He's the God of the what? World, right? Listen to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever in that world, right, See, so John 12, 14, 16 says he's the God of this world. 1 John 5, 19, he's the God of this world. He, he has authority reign, um, rulership. He has rulership, not excusia type, but he has rulership over the domain of the world of the earth, that, and he got it from Adam. You know what I'm saying? Adam's fall is how he got it. He uh, he attacked and got it, just like a lot of people. He conquered them and got it. And that through death, he might render powerless through his death that he might render powerless him who had the power of death, had the authority over it. 
You understand? That is the devil. I mean, he don't have he, he don't have the power of death. He has he reigns over those who are under that. Right? And so he he can do this. Second Corinthians 4 4. It's part of his MOS. He can, right? Remember when we read that? He can do what? He can blind the minds of the unbelieving ones who are perishing, see? Right, so they might not see it, see? He can work against that. And volition, you see, it don't matter because volition, if you believe, boom, you're out of there. You're, listen, you are rescued from the domain of darkness, right? Colossians 1, and you are transferred over to the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of of Christ. We call it the kingdom of God. Are you with me? That's a powerful idea. I can't begin to tell you how what a powerful idea that is. That is an enormous idea. Uh, that is the devil. And here's the second, Hina. He, he don't have to write it again. All he has to do is put an error subjunctive and it's connected. And might free. Free. What are they under the domain of darkness? Slaves to sin and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. He holds that over them. And the only way they can be freed from it is Galatians 1, 5, excuse me, Galatians 5, 1, and 13. In Christ, you are, you are free. You are free indeed. Christ has set you free. And if you're free, you're free indeed. That's the way the King James, I think, says it. Uh, I memorized so much of it from the King James, I flopped back and forth. They're both wonderful translations. Uh, doing good. Well, have a seat. Um, in Colossians 2.10, it says, in him... You have been made complete in Christ. In Christ, you've been made complete. He is the head over all rule and authority. See, that's that idea of being seated. Two doctrinal principles have been established out of this Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. It rendered the death of Jesus Christ on the cross rendered powerless that the devil's power over the spiritually dead of all members of the human race. In other words, it rendered powerless him over that. In other words, if here's the light of the gospel, you lay, you set in darkness, here's the light of the gospel, you have the power to come out by believing it. The power is in the human volition. You can believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the third day. No matter what kind of bondage you're under, the blood of Jesus Christ can release you from the bondage under which you are. You understand that? Because Galatians says, if Christ sets you free, you're free indeed. But now the power to remain free is in the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God. You got to walk in the spirit. You got to walk by faith. But listen, if you're in bondage to something, alcohol, drugs, pornography, women, whatever it is. I mean, whatever the bondage is. If you're in the bondage of chronic lying, whatever your bondage is, you don't have to remain there. You're that you sit there by your own volition. You keep making the same choices. Why don't you make a choice for Christ? Watch him free you from that and then give you the power and sustain you over that addiction or over that adversity in your life. That's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why it's called good news. And listen, the devil tries to blind your mind to believe that to be true. And he might tell you that you could never be delivered from it. Well, I, I, here's what I hear. Well, I've tried to quit, Pastor. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to quit. I always go back. I know that's because the power is not in you to qu quit. The will is, but not the power of the will. So listen, 
you can go by the power of the Holy Spirit, the power over the flesh. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. It's just that simple. It's not complicated, but it does take a commitment, a commitment to come to Christ for your salvation and then to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the power over the flesh. So uh, that's described here. It frees those uh, subject to slavery, to the fear of spiritual death. Uh, th there's even a word for it. Thanatos is the word for spiritual death in the Bible. And then phobia, of course, is fear. And I I'm going to give you a little exercise because I'm out of time today. But I want you to write these questions down somewhere on your paper. Would you write these down? And that, when you go back and study Genesis 3, 1 through 7, I, I want you to... I want you to answer these questions. In regard to Adam and Eve, who did they hide from? Now, some of these you know right off the bat because you're, you're, you're wise. Who did they hide from? One of the things you'll find interesting, they didn't hide from the two people that helped get, get them in trouble. They didn't hide from the serpent, and they didn't hide from Adam, who should have helped him out of it, should have helped her. And we wind up, they both got in a mess. Who did they hide from? Yeah, right. Oh, who were they? Who were they ashamed of their nakedness? They were hiding their nakedness. Why, why, who were they ashamed of their nakedness? Okay. And, and listen, you want, to, you, want to think, you want to think in these questions. You want to think, why are they thinking that way? How did they come to realize they were experientially dead, spiritually dead? How, how did they know experientially? What, what, how, how did they figure that out? That they were experientially spiritually dead? Why are they hiding? Who are they afraid of? Who are they hiding from? Who are they afraid of? And where did that come from? You know, where did that come from? Yeah, that's about as far as I can get tonight. Let's wrap this up. Okay. You Listen, bud. You listen to what I told about Jesus, okay? Thank you. How do you know? He just walks him in, doesn't he? Just walks him in. Yeah, sure he did. Horton had taken me to lunch. On the way home, he said, I want to stop by the market. I got to run by the house a minute. I think we might have a little ministry. Everywhere we rode in that old Volkswagen van he had, we listened to Bob theme tapes. We didn't talk unless we stopped. So he stopped by the supermarket. He lived over in Center Point back in that day, if I remember right. We stopped at the supermarket, and he bought up a whole bunch of watermelon. I said, what you going to do? He said, you'll see. 
So we loaded up, I don't know how many watermelons, but there's a lot of watermelons we put in that little old Volkswagen van. Uh, what did you call that? Bus, a bus. And we went back there, and behind his house was a bunch of pr prisoners cutting right away. It was about lunchtime when we got there, and they were all seated. Or it says, start carrying these watermelons. So we carried the watermelons back there and stacked them up. He went to the guard, and he said, I've got some watermelon for the prisoners. If if you don't mind. And he said, I think they would really like that. He said, the only thing I'm going to ask is the privilege to talk to them about Jesus Christ, whether they're eating watermelon, if I could do that. And he said, well, that sounds fair enough to me. And so the guards stood over them with a shotgun. Horton stood over them with a Bible and watermelon presented the gospel of Jesus Christ, gave an invitation for them guys to be saved. There are just some things you never forget. I salute you. He's the same Horton today as he was yesterday and tomorrow, I hope. Always out there looking for an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, I was privileged to be along for the journey, and it was a great experience in my life. Let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the young man you had drop in to get a piece of watermelon. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody tells him you usually get food if they're open there at night. That's a good thing. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of conviction upon his life. I thank you for the years that we've had together with Horton still boots on the field still out there chunking it, still looking for people interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ across the highways of America. I pray, Father, you'd encourage our hearts to be bold with the gospel of Jesus Christ. People are hungry everywhere. They're hungry, for the, they're hungry to be saved. They just don't know how. They carry burdens they don't have to carry. They carry death they don't have to carry. They carry debt they don't have to carry. And we have the answer. Oh my goodness. We have the good news. Father, we have the good news. Mm -mm -mm. Encourage our hearts. Encourage our hearts. Human volition in the angelic economy. That's what the prize is all about. That's the prize. Make us good stewards of the gospel. Let us always bring light into dark places. Let the light shine. Let the light shine. Turn the light on. Let it shine. I make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.